All right, everybody, welcome back to the Move Podcast. Talking about Perry Roubaix, not just the men's race, but also the women's race. And by the way, happy Easter, everybody. Speaking of Easter, look at that. We're joined by the Easter Bunny, Allison Tetrick, <laughs> over there in Petaluma, California. And I just came up with a million dollar idea for her, for her in the Chamber of Commerce there, because I'm assuming it's a good bike ride. It's called Pedal Luma. Just send me some proceeds. I think standard royalty is about 7%. But let's look for that merch on the We Do soon. <laughs> yeah, Pedal Luma. Yeah. And the diva done with his stage race over there in Pixa. North Carolina, George Hincapie, Mr. Perry Ribay, actually. Thanks for having me. Pisgah, North Carolina. Pisgah, yeah, this is well. <laughs> was, it was, it was, well, you, did you bring a box of tissues there for Mr. Julik on all the downhills? Because he was crying <laughs> like a baby. We had some fun. He wasn't crying. He was having fun, but it was uh, definitely a little <laughs> bit, a little bit chunky, let's just say. Did y'all do that on a tandem? A divorce no. machine? <laughs> That'd have been cute. Definitely not. You and yeah. Bobby J cruising around on a mountain bike tandem. <laughs> it's hard enough uh, on a single bike. Uh, I'm gonna have some fun with this first ad with you and Julik. Don't you worry. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Graphic designer over there in Madrid, Johan Brunil, just gets better and better. Look at I that. I know that's probably it, his it, best it is, work. That is some of the best work he's done. They got the sun just right. Golly. Down there in ATX. <laughs> he's clearly taking refuge in the old airstream the man cave the man cave i heard i heard raleigh's got a, a bunch of friends in town jb's like fuck it i'm gonna stay in the airstream <laughs> I, 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 can't, I just kicked them all out god <laughs> uh yeah we're talking about perry Rebay. lots to talk about uh on both both sides um today's show brought to you by manscaped so here's a question so this would be the best thing, Jordan. <laughs> you do you and Bobby J riding around all the time. Y'all should manscape each other. <laughs> Did you just think of that? I, I thought I was on, like off the hook by wearing the t-shirt last weekend or last week's show. But this um, yeah, just, y'all just out there sharing. <laughs> it's amazing. But in all seriousness, these these guys, the global leaders and men's below the way. <laughs> just see you and Bobby. <laughs> Oh shit! For real? Getting <laughs> ready, for, getting ready for their Easter weekend. <laughs> we might need JB to take over this ad for you. Uh, <laughs> they offer precision-engineered tools for your family jewels, and they are now offering products for your not-so-private parts. Okay, we have an exclusive offer for our audience. Use the code The Move to get twenty percent off, plus free shipping at Manscaped.com. Join the movement. Also. April is National Testicular Cancer Awareness Month. They lean in hard there. Appreciate all their great work. Um, one more time, that's manscaped.com. Discount code, the move. <laughs> Make sure Bobby gets it. Seriously. We'll get him. We'll get him a set. Dude, I mean, just imagine. But I'm not, I'm not doing it to him. No, I, there's, <laughs> there's a line that I will not cross. Uh, you know I'll do everything possible for the show, but this I will not do. <laughs> okay. Also today brought to you by Athletic Greens. This is something uh, I'm just super religious about this now, and I'm not religious about very many things. Uh, I'm just not good with veggies and all that stuff you're supposed to eat that your mama told you to eat. Uh, but I was after better gut health, better energy. I just, you know, this is the, the cleanest, uh, most direct way for me to get this stuff in. I started taking my Athletic Greens once a day. 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens help you start your day off just right. Also, it's less than three bucks a day. You can't even, I mean, compare that to all the vegetables you're supposed to buy. Your mom told you to get. Let's make it easy. Athletic Greens is going to give you one uh, a free one year supply of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash the move. One more time, that's athleticgreens.com slash the move. Take control of your health. You and Bobby could mix it up together. And <laughs> Yo, I know Johan's loving this. He's Johan's always off like no, I'm surprised Johan hasn't chimed in because I know, he's, he's really off, the one that he's, starts look, he's this. just he's just reveling in it. He's always yeah. offline when they're like, dude, what's up with George and Bobby? He's saving it for the, it's uh, a legit it's a legit question. Allison wins best dress with those Beaster Bunny here's that is 
and 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 the backstory and i promise y'all we are going to talk about the bike races that took place yesterday and today but apparently there was some really sweet innocent kid walking around with bunny ears yesterday until allison just came over and just yanked them off their head i put them in my helmet i rode all the way home with these bunny ears so happy easter i'm sure the kids eating chocolate somewhere just missing their ears <laughs> <laughs> searching for eggs and searching for their easter bunny ears um let's talk about the women's race second year in a row the finally you know we we're back and i love too that the designated day right just boom hell to the yes i think it's awesome and yeah. zwift coming in as a title sponsor yep. which we'll be talking about zwift later again with the tour de france fom effect zwift as well so kudos to companies that are sponsoring and making new rules for the game so super exciting to watch the second women's Paris Bay. still jealous i was never able to race it but mm. living what vicariously you, it's, it's, it's not too late it's true it's true what are, what are your thoughts uh especially you ally on doing it the day prior i thought i thought it made it more of its own thing i agree and, and, and it makes for more of a festival kind of weekend for all the spectators to get more out of it what are your thoughts instead of running it just before like they did it at flanders um personally if from my experience racing flanders flesh other classics um that ran the same day as the men's i really did like that because it the crowds can kind of get two for the price of one but um i think it's also a huge step to be able to do two significantly different events on you know two different days like i think that is a huge logistical like logistical expense for the communities to do that and I props to them but going up Flanders you know either right before or right after the men I mean it's just the, the crowd I think gets a lot more um you get bigger crowds and more exposure but with this though this year there was more coverage of the women's race too to be able to watch it on streaming and and all over the world so if it's a standalone event that way and we get more coverage that's awesome but just more crowds, more people watching women cycling. Visibility is viability. So however that works, props to you. As long Whoa. as there's fans. Did you guys, y'all heard that, right? From these, <laughs> visibility is viability. That was, that was, that was a serious drop right there. You know what else <laughs> visibility will do when I watch the women's race is it can get you DQ'd. <laughs> yeah. I mean, not without controversy. Right? Gotta, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I didn't catch that. I don't know how sticky the bottle was. It was uh, sticky. It was <laughs> pretty sticky. Lots of stick on that bottle. Johan, well, let's just, Johan, how sticky? Because you, 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 let's not uh, hide the, anything listen, here. The sticky George, bottle is a major part of racing, but let's talk George, about how sticky it was. It was not as sticky as many sticky bottles I've given. Okay, that's my <laughs> point. <laughs> exactly. And, 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 you know, and things, things have changed, you know, before, uh, you know, as long as I can remember, as soon as I started racing pro, uh, that was just part of it. And, you know, whenever you had a, a mechanical or a crash, it was considered normal. First of all, that you could take advantage of the caravan and that you could draft behind the cars until you were back in the, in the Peloton. And, uh, you know, sticky bottles were, were just, you're, you know, a, you're, you're, ta you're, ta rule. you're taught from day one as a professional cyclist, not to grab the bottle like this. You got to grab the bottle like this. Yeah. Always. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, and so, of course, was, we're talking was... about Elisa Balsamo getting right. DQ'd from mm. Paris Roubaix. Um, and this is our current world champion, just to clear everyone in. So, she's actually yeah. DQ'd within 58K to go or something. So, she's been racing a while. Well, um, part of it, if, if people didn't see the sticky bottle, it also advanced her in ahead of two other riders while just, it was happening. Well, and, and, and uh, to, to double click on that, for those who are sitting here listening, going, what, what the hell is a sticky bottle? Um, so you basically, the director, let's just break this down, bike racing one-on-one, -on -one, the director, you're, you're, something has happened, uh, a mechanical flat, your drop, whatever you're, you're off the back. The director, of course, hands out bottles all the time during the race and riders grab them. Now they can also hold out the bottle and not let go of it. And you hold on to the bottle hence. And then he just floors the car or he yeah. or she floors the car. And, um, and you know, you you go 20 miles an hour faster. So it, uh, it's, it is, it's super common, right? And uh, then Lance, it, you probably wouldn't know much about this, but it's also just a way to go back and get bottles for your leaders. I mean, you, you're yeah. always trying to save energy in the bunch. So when you're going mm -hmm. back and getting five, 10 bottles, every time you get one, you get a little bit of a sticky bottle just to conserve energy. Yeah, that, but that, and, and you're right. I have no, I have no idea about that. 
there's <laughs> limits there's limits to it you know i think i think sticky bottles are still part of it because it's a technique you know whoever comes back for bottles every single bottle the driver the director just accelerates a little tiny bit and because otherwise before you know it you're kind of five six cars down and you, you know you have that extra weight on your back but in this case of course um, you know, it was just one sticky bottle. I don't know if she had a problem, if she had a, had a mechanical or a crash. Uh, uh, flat tire. Did. Yeah. Flat tire, yeah. yep. Yeah, you see, so 10 years ago, 15 years ago, this would have never have been a DQ, never. Uh, hmm. Nowadays, you know, uh, and, and, it, and it, in my opinion, it goes together with the fact that, you know, the stage is, you know, there's cameras everywhere. And, and even if it's not called on TV, somebody will be filming it even somebody in a car of a compete of a competing team and then afterwards they will go to the commissaires and they'll show it and you still may be disqualified so things have evolved and sticky bottles uh, are less and less common and let's just say that that rainbow jersey just shines a little more brightly when you're getting yeah, that sticky bottle course. right but all was not lost for Tre uh, trek segafredo obviously i mean they did. yeah i don't know when they got the news of the disqualification probably not till after the race right they had it during the race oh they did okay so mm -hmm. but but all was not lost they still ended up with it's elisa balsamo is who is our current world champion that got disqualified and then you have elisa longo Borghini, who uh -huh. is our next champion of paris roubaix so trek mm -hmm. segafredo is batting two for two on winning the women's paris roubaix of x whip mm -hmm. elb yes. we'll just call her elb I uh, um, no. have a nickname for, and I haven't cleared it with her. So, um, but we call her Lamborghini because <laughs> I've known this woman. I've raced against her. I've known her since she was probably under drinking age. Um, she's an incredibly talented athlete. Um, mm. Very consistent. If you look at her results, she has two bronze medals in the Olympics road race. Uh, she's Italian national champion, time trial champion for Italy as well. And she's only 30 years old. Um, she's one Flanders, one Strade Bianchi. Um, hmm. this year she had a little bit of a slow start, but I call her Lamborghini because that girl just freaking attacks. She attacks, doesn't look back. And she, I think is a great teammate for Lizzie Dagman before. And then now this was her opportunity to shine. Um, she came into this event a little, a little nervous. She said she had some anxiety and she had some health issues, sinus problems, you know, hmm. I don't know if I'm good. I don't know if I'm good. Her team says, you're good. You go. And like I call her Lamborghini, but Elisa, Lisa Longo Borghini just goes and 30 K to go. And so it's the second women's Paris Roubaix and second solo win by Trek Segafredo. And to also say that they had three women in the top seven. Mm -hmm. So that's the depth of the field. Um, and that's even including the DQ of the current world champion who also had a really good shot for the day as well. So, um, props to Ina Yo Yoko Tutenberg, the director of Trek Segafredo. And I mm -hmm. think she's just a stellar athlete herself, but God, I mean, they had a lot of cards to play. If you have Lucinda Brand and Ellen Van Dyke, like in the chase group with a solo rider off the front, I mean, Basta. Yeah. Basta. And she, and she was also, she Italian was, uh, director, sorry. <laughs> she, she was, she was third last year, right? Also uh, Longo Borghini. She was third last year. Yep. Um, third and, last uh, year. Yeah. So when I think, I think yesterday she saw her chance, you know, two of the big favorites were not there, Lisa. Dagnan uh, was not there. Everybody knew that. Uh, expecting a baby, except but you. Mariana Vos. Well, I mean, I, 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 I <laughs> in know the pre-show, Johan's like, "Why didn't Lizzie Daniel race?" And Allison goes, "Because she's pregnant." You don't have to say that. You don't have to say that on the real show. <laughs> I thought it was just so good. <laughs> and um, and yeah, Mariana Vos uh, probably also you know probably the biggest favorite, uh, not starting due to uh, a last minute positive COVID test. So mm. she definitely took her chance. But as, as, as you say, Alison, you know, she is probably the most consistent women cyclist. She's always there. Um, I mean, you call her Lamborghini. I, I would, <laughs> you know, it's a nice name, but I would probably more compare her to a diesel, uh, you know, who, like a, a very strong car that keeps going, keeps going for a very long time. Um, she was the best no doubt, no discussion. She looks so smooth off the front. And Lance and I were texting yesterday. Um, I think I passed the test because like 6.13 in the morning, I get a text from Lance, are you watching? And I'm like, hell yes, I'm watching. <laughs> what do you think I'm doing, <laughs> sleeping in? And he's like, what gear is she running? So other interesting, she's similar to Lizzie last year. Uh, Alisa was running a one-by by SRAM, uh, 52 
tooth front chain ring and a 1033 in the back. So that's Ram red ETAP. Um, they also did some special modifications, making sure, you know, batteries and chain dropping and all of that for the cobble. So, and is the chain ring was also arrow. So that girl was ready to like party, man. Like she had that bike set up, ready to rock and roll in those cobbles. So, um, I think Trek did a great job. And then I guess I would agree with you too, Johan, that the, the most unfortunate team would be Yumbo Vismo that day with boss having the positive test. I think Corinne Lebecki, um, who you guys all know is my like, you know, girl crush and one of my best friends, but you know, three flats and chasing back and chasing back. And I don't know, I just felt like there was flats in both the men's and the women's race, like complete carnage. And George, you can chime in on that later, but I don't know if I've ever seen so many flats and dry conditions on this, but we'll, we'll we can touch on that. And then I think, uh, SD works, Johan, you can, you can talk about their tactics, but you, they have a lot of Kapeki who just came off this stellar win at not only Strata Bianchi, which was, I thought, more impressive than on most of the Flanders because Kapeki is known as a pure sprinter and she won Strata Bianchi this year. And then she goes in to win Flanders and she comes in obviously with a clear favorite and she's got Chantel on um, there with her. She's, you know, has these teammates, but she kind of like didn't full send that, that break she was in, it gets brought back and mm-hmm. Longo Bergini counters it. And, you know, it's, I'm going to say boss again. It was, you know, she's gone. <laughs> so I don't yeah, know on, that, on the tactics, Johan. Ali, talk, well, b- before Johan gets into it, I mean, talk about the mental mindset with someone like um, the winner of the race, knowing that she's got two or three other strong teammates in the group. It's just, she's really got at that point, nothing to lose. She's feeling good. Like you said, they did a lot of research on the equipment. She's confident on the bike. She's got a great team behind her. It's almost like she's got nothing to lose when she makes that move. Cause she knows she's got her teammates right there in the back. That's true. That's that's, it's absolutely true. So it's completely like you can be fearless knowing that you've got world champions behind you that are like, oh, I can just sit on any day now, mm-hmm. you know, not necessarily smoking cigarettes back there, but they can sit on and, and cover and kill basically. And it gave her a lot of, of leg room. And I think what happened with SD works is um, it was uh Shikini that went with uh, Lago Borghini and, and um, also Emma Norsgaard. And she kind of either Elisa like rode them off their wheel or there's some team tactics going, whoa, 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 come back and let's like bring this back together and reshuffle the deck. I've heard conflicting, conflicting news, whether they were called back or dropped, you know, mm-hmm. it's, I would, I would be, I would be shocked. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know if we've ever seen anybody be called back in a race like Roubaix. It's a flat race. If anything, okay. you just sit on the wheel uh, because it's a flat race. It's not like a big climb coming. You should be able to hold on to the wheel, but I would be shocked if she was actually called back. What do you think, yeah. Johan? No, I, I think, I think you know, if looking at the images, I, I think that they actually never made it to the wheel of Longo Borghini. They were, they were there, and they were like ten meters behind, and they, they never made it. Uh, That's now, where the Lamborghini if, came in, Johan. I'm telling you, yeah. the Lamborghini right there went. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, at that point in the race, once she's going. Uh, I, I, I don't think it was because they were hesitating. They, they just didn't have the legs, in my opinion, these two. Um, and then, you know, I've, I've read about as the works that there was some confusion about who really was going to be the leader, uh, if they have switched that during the race or not. If it was going to be Lotte Kopecki or Chantal, uh, what's her name? Vandenbroek Black, right? Yep. Yep. Um, so so I don't know what, what was going on there, but but I, I think... Th- all of, the, all of this didn't really matter because Trek Segafredo was definitely the strongest team. You know, they had, they had Lucinda Brandt there who's, you know, has amazing experience cyclocross, so uh, multiple world champion cyclocross and, uh, and then um, Alan Van Dijk who's in, in amazing shape, who's about to attack the world, the hour record, I think. Yep, in May she's uh, going to do the, yeah, yeah, yeah. she's going to do the hour record in May and she's a world yeah. champion on the time trial. Having her yeah. lead out Lucinda in the track for third place. I mean, it's, it was beautiful. I thought, yeah, kudos to, to everybody there, but awesome. It was a great and pro- race. And uh, props to Zwift for their you know support. And we're going to see it with the women's tour de France, but their support of women's racing, you know? Mm-hmm. So oh yeah. You know, if, if you want to support women's cycling, fire off a note to them saying, we appreciate this. I think that'd be cool. Yeah. I, I'm going to lead some rides, shameless plug, but you know, into the tour de France bomb of X Swift as well. So, um, some women's ride with pros. So you can come ride Lance. You can come learn a little more about the pro Peloton if you want, Yep. you know, I need it'll it. be cool. I'll come with you guys on, we do too, but, um, I just love the landmark that Swift did on their, you know, on the race and stuff. It looked awesome. And I'm just so proud of that company to invest in that sport. And I thought it was one hell of a race in the hell of the North. <laughs> Look at you did it again. <laughs> God, you are really the MVP of this 
it's <laughs> well if i can't be the diva i might as well be the mvp no, that's right yeah that's you right. won't win the diva battle first time in my <laughs> life <laughs> Uh, before we jump into the men's race, today's show also brought to you by LMNT. Uh, we talk about it all the time. And now that I'm back training again more seriously so I can keep up with George and Bobby Julik of, of sorts, uh, folks like that, you know, you guys know it. I sweat a ton. I got to replace all these vital things that you lose when you sweat. Um, my go-to hydration source is LMNT. And by the way, this company, I just, I just saw some numbers. They're absolutely killing it. Uh, thanks to you all for supporting them. 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, 60 milligrams of magnesium, no sugar, no gluten, just no crap. It's the real deal. And best of all, uh, if you don't like it, just give it to a friend, another salty friend. You get a full refund. Our listeners can try it for free. It's free plus shipping. Here's how it works. The Move listeners can purchase an LMNT sample pack for just the cost of shipping. Head on over to drinklmnt.com slash the move. And get your recharge sample pack for just the cost of shipping. That's drink lmnt.com slash the move. Last one of the day, bird dogs. I'm out here in Santa Barbara. So I thought, you know, <clears throat> I'm at the Rosewood Mamma. It's very swanky. Um, <laughs> you playing some uh, clay court tennis? You know, they have one of these things. I don't even know what it is where you like throw the ball, like those long, uh, just lanes, you know, like throw the ball. I don't Bocce know ball? But maybe, bo yeah, something like that but I'm rocking the bird dogs out there. I've got the pants. I've got the shorts. I've got this incredible built-in like liner. You don't even need, you, you just free ball. It's amazing. Um, and check this out. And so I have a question for the folks at bird dogs uh, with, with, when you go to birddogs.com, you enter the promo code, the move, they're going to throw in a free bird dogs, dad hat. So now when I go do this, I expect five hats. Okay. Bird doggers. Seriously, this stuff is, is, is dope. Go to birddogs.com, enter the promo code, the move free dad hat as well. Five of them for me. Did you plan like all your family to walk behind you? I, it's, that it's, <laughs> well, I, I'm in a hotel. What do you, what do you, yeah. I'm just glad they had Max didn't have a key a second ago. So that's why I had to get up, but I'm glad that Anna had a key. I think it's kind of a nice, you know, on Easter. Stop. Okay. <laughs> right, let's, let's talk. Move on. Let's, let's talk about the men's, the men's race. I mean, yeah. Dylan Van Barlow, this kid, the, the, he's been up there. And, and I think the, to me, the real, the headline of the race, I mean, any OC people have, have written this team off or not written them off been uh, you know, sort of concerned for where they are, boy, they're back. I mean, what a week mm -hmm. for them. Hello. They're yeah. back. We got to We got a shout out to Magnus Sheffield who uh, had some bad luck today with a crash, but <clears throat> went in, uh, uh, Brabham on on Wednesday, which we all, Lance, you and I have done that race. It's a very hard race, sort of a semi-classic. 19-year-old American kid. I mean, come on, we have a new classic star, you know, looking at us right now, and I can't wait to watch this kid progress. But like you said, I mean, I woke up this morning, and I go, Johan, how did the field split? I mean, Ineos just went to the front, split it up in the crosswinds. As a favorite, you know, any of the four- to five-star favorites of Paris-Roubaix, their main job in that first 100K is to save as much energy as possible. Johan and Dirk would always say, do not do anything. We'll send one or two guys in the breakaway. Do not hit the win. So these guys are not expecting a full team of Ineos, one of the strongest classes team in the punch, to go up there and split it up. There had to have been some panic setting in there with, you know, uh, Van der Poel and Wout Van Aert and a lot of these favorites. There clearly was as they went to the front with the Alpes and Phoenix and, um, uh, Francais de Joux doing a lot of work, which they typically would not want to do in that first part of the race. So I feel like that move Ineos made just changed the whole dynamics of the entire race. You saw from then on, there was groups of 20, 30, 50 groups everywhere, riders everywhere. It made the race a lot harder. Yeah, I agree. I agree, George. I, th I think, you know, as we, as we said before, um, most likely the favorites were going to come back to the, the main, the, the main favorites of the, of the breakaway. Uh, but you see, as in, as in Paris Roubaix, there's always guys who stay in there. You know, uh, we had this, I mean, even to me, unknown Belgian today. Uh, Thomas, what's, what's his name? Thomas de Vriend or Tom de Vriend. Uh, 30 years old from West Flanders, from my area. I, you know, I didn't really know him. He has won two races, two races in his career. All of a sudden, with 35 kilometers to go, he's up there by himself in, in Paris Roubaix. Uh, but as you say, you know, seven riders of Ineos, the whole team goes to the front. And I think that guys like Van Aert, I mean, Van Aert, 
okay, he had this story or his team had this story. Like, okay, we're going to see how he is. He's going to be in at the service of the team. You know, we all know that if, if Walt Van Aert starts Paris-Roubaix, that he was going to be 100%. He Listen, knew that. We're, we're, we're not falling for any of this bullshit anymore, right? We saw it last week <laughs> yeah. with Pitcock. Ah, oh, just, you know, just, just, I can't seem to get over this illness and I'm just here to work for the team and da, 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 da. No. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. But and, can't fall does Ghana, and does Ghana yeah. actually count as only one rider? I feel like Ineos had a couple extra riders if, like, <laughs> my dream is just a motor pace behind that guy. Like, yeah, he's, and, he was and, he was strong. He had really bad luck. Yeah, he had such he, bad he, luck. <laughs> yeah, he had bad luck. But uh, but I mean, as as a team, you know, Ineos, they were confident. They, it's I think physically they're different, but especially, you know, they believe again in themselves. You know, Amstel Gold Race, Flash Brabanson, they were up there in Tour of Flanders, second in Tour of Flanders, uh, plus a bunch of other state races they have won with 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 other riders. Um, they're back they're back yeah. and uh you know where they have never really been shining in the classics this is where we see them now um with riders who have been around forever so there's definitely a shift in the mentality going on there in in, in the off season and I, I it's nice to see them back up there well compare and contrast right you got Ineos here that has you know the momentum back again then you have quick step which mm just continues to, to the, that train is off the tracks. I don't know what's up, Definitely. but it's, it's hard. And we know this is, 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 as well as anybody when that, when, you know, when the, when the team is firing, man, the dinner table is different. The ride in the bus to the start is different. The morale obviously is just completely different. And, and, yeah. um, and you see it with Enios and you also see it with quick step. They're sitting around going, damn, what, what, yeah. what, what just, what's going wrong here? Well, there's no doubt you got to have some high morale. If you're going to the front with the whole team of riders with 240 or 220 kilometers to go in Paris Roubaix and putting it all in for a, a crosswind crosswind effort, you know, in Paris Roubaix, I don't, we've rarely seen that, Johan. Of course, we've seen big breakaways get away, but where a team actually does all that damage, you know, they came in with some serious confidence. They came in with a plan, and they executed to perfection. Yeah, and and also, I mean. What was really remarkable, I think, is that they were not on their own. I mean, it's, normally you would, you would see, and these are things that have changed, in my opinion. You know, if you would see one team with all of their riders, all the other teams would never col collaborate. Now we, we saw, okay, Quickstep had four or five guys in there. They straight away put up, put up two guys. Total Direct Energy had a few guys, so there were other teams who were, who were working together. And I personally think that the panic and the, nerve, the nerves in the back of Alpecin and Van Aert and, and even uh, uh, Francaise de Jeux with Stefan Kuhn, who was, was also one of the three favorites. Um, I think that costs a lot of energy, um, not, just, not just with their teammates. I mean, th already that makes that you, you know you're not going to have two or three teammates deeper in the race because you have to use those teammates so early. Um, well, not yet. So I, and like you mentioned, I agree you, that mentioned that you mentioned earlier, Johan, this, I mean, the fact that these guys are away, sure, the, the, the group was still 40, 50 guys. But the battle for position is so much less than behind. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's what Roubaix is all about, battling for position. And But while doing it, trying to conserve energy as well. So if you're doing yeah. it with, you know, 100 less guys, it makes it a lot easier. And like you said, these guys are conserving energy, even though they had to go hard from the beginning. Once they're coming into those sections, they're able to perhaps relax a bit more. Yeah. 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 You know, I'd love to get all of your thoughts on all the punctures. In fact, Ali, you you already said that, that you've never seen so many, uh, especially for a dry Roubaix, and, and people are experimenting with new tubeless, different sizes. What are your thoughts on that? Is it the, is it the tubeless that's doing And you hate for uh, a, a puncture to, to dictate the, the, you know, the podium, but mm -hmm. it's also pretty damn exciting for the spectator with that unknown of a puncture changing things in a second. What but but before Allison gets into that, I mean, let's not be mistaken. That, that is just part of this race. I mean, it, it's the, the cobbles are so not, not that I <laughs> would necessarily know, but the, even the ones, you know, sort of the, the beginner cobbles that I've ridden. I mean, they're terrible. Like uh, how, how they're, how, how everybody doesn't flat is always kind of a shock to me. It's like, how, mm -hmm. man, it's, and, and not to mention places like the force of Aramberg and these other five-star sections. I mean, most folks would see these and be like, no, we, 
But George, you've taken guys there and they're like, come on, nobody rides their bike on this. It is that bad. I mean, I don't know how you yeah, get it is. It is. I mean, you have no idea. I mean, I'm like you, Lance. I've never raced Paris Roubaix. Uh, but, you know, as, as a team director, I've seen it many times. You cannot, until you don't see it with your own eyes, you cannot believe how bad this is. And that, and even if the, the, the equipment gets better, they have wider tires and, you know, better, better suspension and whatever. Um, it's not made for bike for, for, for bikes. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, that, that's really, it, it takes, it takes, a lot of physical strength, but it takes so much skills to ride over those. And that, you know, the punctures, it's, it's inevitable. Did you and feel like it was more of cobbles? Oh yeah. Go Sorry, ahead. George. There's, there's 50 kilometers of cobbles. And what we talk about the position battle for these early sections, which is this complete chaos, danger, people jumping on sidewalks, crashes, and then you hit the cobbles and the cobbles, as you know, just your body just gets rattled to pieces. But then comes the worst part when you come out of these cobbles and your body's been shaking around for, you know, whatever it is, three to five minutes, six minutes, your legs just feel like rubber. Like, especially coming out of the forest of Ehrenberg, you take that left turn and it's a dead flat road. You can see for about a mile or two. And for like the th first 30, 45 seconds, you feel like I can't even pedal right now. My legs are complete rubber. And it's just, that's what people don't understand is like, it's not only the battle for position, the cobbles, but then once you come off the cobbles, your body just doesn't even know what to do for a few seconds after you get off those sections. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, uh, in terms of, in terms of uh, the puncture, JB, um, George, what do you think? I mean, more and more teams are switching to tubeless. Uh, I, I, I saw, is it, is I saw a lot of the guys like, I mean, they're using 30 mil tires. You think the tires are better? I personally saw a lot of the guys riding on the side of the road a lot more than normal. I mean, Ghana, he flatted a couple of times. He's on the side of the road. Yes, it's faster, but there's a lot of those little pebbles there where the risk of flatting becomes a lot higher. And I think we're going to be talking a lot of what ifs. I mean, you saw while Van Art uh, had a, had a, some sort of mechanical, you said he rode on somebody else's bike on the Ehrenberg, mm -hmm. which is one of the hardest sections comes out of that has to bridge back up. And then from 60 kilometers to go on, he's on, he's relentless. You said he was on fire. You know, when we were texting each other, he's attacking, then he flats, then he comes mm -hmm. back and he keeps attacking and he still gets second place. I mean, Wout had an incredible race, but a lot of these guys, Jasper Sturman uh, flatted when he was in a prime, prime position to get podium. So even though um, Dylan rode a perfect race, I don't think he had any mechanicals, but a lot of Roubaix is luck as well. I mean, you don't have the mechanicals, you have a good day. You gotta yeah. have that luck as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. How much do you think Roubaix is um, luck versus pure strength? Obviously, the strongest, luckiest rider wins, let's be honest. But like on a scale of luck to strength and teamwork, where do you think Paris Roubaix lies? I, I got to say it's pretty close to equal. I mean, you saw, you know, like we said, Dylan was extremely strong when he got away. And then you saw Wout and uh, Kuhn go after him. He still continued to put time on them. Sure, he was on his own. He had his, he's had his lines, but he was on an amazing day and he had luck. So he ended up winning the race by over a minute. I mean, I think both of those were equally as important today. Well, speaking of luck, we got to talk about bad luck. I mean, this, and if you haven't seen it, you can, and we'll show it here. This is actually kind of a cool thing we can, we can tease out because we're now going to have some video clips uh, uh, for the races that are put on by ASO, which obviously includes the Tour de France both tours. Um, so, but, the, but Eve Lampert, you know, and I've been in that place where, where you're just trying to get, take full advantage of the road. You're, you're, you're as far right as you can go. It just takes, and you're going 30 miles an hour. It doesn't take much to send you flying. We can reflect on the 2003 tour with the, the kid with the musette, um, which by the way, hundred percent, my fault, Eve Lampert, just, just too close. And there was somebody there and what a, what a crash. And I, I got to give him some props. I think he saved it because it could have been a lot worse, but um, of course the headline will probably be these people in the road. What are they doing? But he, he was too close. That, that was, that was, he, he, he was close. That section is known. That section is with 10 kilometers to go. You get past the cap for the ob, you get past the hardest sections, you get to that part of the point in the race. And I can guarantee you, you go, Thank God I did not crash in Paris Bay because the cobbles are over. You can take the bike path. That was the last thing on that poor kid's mind was some spectator taking him out because you're going to want to use that smooth part of the road. Everybody knows it's there. Everybody knows the rider's going to be on it. Um, and then the spectator is just, you know, with his hands out. I mean, I, I was really disappointed to see that. Well, but you have, George, he has to see him. George, it's a matter of, it's really a matter of bad luck. I mean, because on all those sectors, the spectators are actually a lot closer 
they exactly. know, that's the last sector. And you he know, got so through all of that. You, you pass them, you know, you, you, people are touching you, you're touching people, whatever. Uh, and then on that last relatively easy part, uh, but that's also because you're trying to use every inch, you know, they're on the limit, they're completely empty. I don't think, I personally don't know any, any other race, especially when you, when you see the final of the race from the car, where the riders are more empty than in Paris-Roubaix. It, it, you know, it's, I'm not saying they go slow, but it really feels slow when you get finally to the, to the head of the race in the last 20 kilometers, it's dead bodies everywhere. It's just the, the one who's a little bit more alive than the other one wins. Um, and, uh, and yeah, wow. I mean, and, and, uh, and Lampard was obviously trying to, you know, get advantage of that little bit of asphalt and, uh, you know, it's a debate we can have, but, uh, but, you know, these things are also part of the race. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's been other crashes of other riders on the sectors because of spectators and uh, you just have to, you have to be aware of it and, and, and pay attention to everything. For conspiracy I, I theory, that was actually Opie. <laughs> so from the tour. <laughs> I well, you know, but and, like, just but I'm going to go back to what, what Lance said, you know, you got to see the guy, you got to see the spectator there. Gotta yes and it. no. I mean, I think my opinion, Lampard's full gas, like you said, Johan, he's running on fumes. He's made it through the most dangerous sections of Paris Roubaix. And in my mind, I would never be expecting an spectator not to pull away. You always expect it to, to pull their hands away at the last minute. Yeah. This guy did yeah. not. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. I mean, I think that was really, really well, bad. but you, you just, okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, nonetheless, it, 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 and you guys got to watch it. And I think we'll show it here on, on the show, but man, I mean, from one side of the road to the other, it, it just, and, and the, yeah, I've never taken a big tumble on cobbles like that, but that is the hardest place you could hit the ground is, is cobblestone so yeah i can't help but wonder though what you, sally brought up the whole omi opie sign thing this isn't much different or different at all and that woman was like the most hated person in france and and had to face charges like did that yeah, set I a precedent we're, where we're totally, spectators could totally be responsible different. totally yeah, I was say, I think it's, it's different uh, in the sense that she didn't take she didn't take out eight, 80 riders she took or mm. this person took out one rider i guess that's i think it's difference. very I think it's very different, you know. The the in the Tour de France, the woman was standing there with a with a sign. She wanted to be seen. Uh, this guy, it's yeah. you know, just you know, bad luck being at the at the wrong place at the wrong moment. And um, you can also say, you know, on 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 sectors like that, you know, why are spectators allowed to be that close? You know, that's this is what we always say. You know, the charm of cycling is that the spectators can basically, you know, they can touch them if they want. They can hear them breathe when they pass. Um, it involves, of course, risks and, and dangers like this, um, but it's not going to change. You, it's, it's, you cannot fence 250, 260 kilometers of, uh, of road on both sides um, for that, just for that one day. And the clip here, I'm just watching the clip on YouTube, uh, at least the one I have pulled up. It, it's actually the top. You can't, you can't see if he has it, if he's looking down or if he's looking straight ahead. So the, the, the obvious question is, you know, sometimes guys are going so hard, they're looking down. Right, and just riding, trying to ride straight. You can't see where he's looking, but he clearly. And the guys, you know, I mean, the dude's not in the middle of the road. He's he's on the side of the road, and and Lampert is trying to take advantage of that smooth pavement on the side. But by comparison, Mohoric is right behind him. He's a good, you know, half a meter to the left. You know, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. But the, the, uh, the race is hard enough. The race is yeah. hard enough. It, it, I can imagine so. But before George, uh, when you were racing, they didn't put those plastic things there to to force the riders on the cobbles, right? Because on on, on part of that that last section or the second last section, they put like these plastic, you know, things there on the. On uh, the, on what, the I think I think the last couple of years they were there, but you can still find at, at that point in the race. You're looking for whatever smooth piece of pavement you can. It doesn't matter where it is. You're going to find it and you're going to go that way. But um, it makes it so more dangerous find because it. you could see even Van Aert was looking for me, but they go on it and then they have to go off it again. And then they have another 10 meters. They have to go off. Yeah, I think exactly. It makes it, more no, that, it makes it more dangerous. Absolutely. That's for mm -hmm. sure. Hmm. Good stuff. Hey, in other news, uh, George, Johan, we're going back to Mallorca. The move Mallorca is coming back. We're going to do that fantasy camp, training camp. That's why I'm training right now, just to get ready for Mallorca with George. 
And, and by the way, that's in September. That's how that's how committed I am to this. I'm starting in April. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a, that was a great, great fun camp. I'm looking forward to going back to with, my with camp. with special guests. We were blessed last year to have our good friend Jan Ulrich there, uh, who's been a wild ride. But man, Johan, I don't know. I, I think the man looks. I think the man's back again. He looks. He looks back. good again. He looks His good. Again. Cat's we're, we're, got nine lives. Happy to see. Happy to see oh, that he's doing well. So and looks looks very very good. Too. And we yeah. get a lot of questions about Jan. So that that I don't think we need to get into too much of the personal stuff but he's doing good right I mean, that's yeah. always the question hey how's Jan? yeah and the answer is well. it's yeah. we got positive news there so yeah um Yo, yeah, what, so what happens now with um with dylan i mean you said he's got some teams going after him mm. obviously i mean he's got he's got second place at the world championships last year second place at flanders solo victory in paris to bay i mean he's going to be one of the most sought after riders for next season what do you, what do you think is going to end up happening with him i think today changes everything for him you know because i think until until before today he was i think he was wanted on teams because he he was he is and was a super domestique a guy you can take to any race you know he can be up there in the classics but he's for sure on the tour de france team you know, you can rely on a super, super, a lot of experience. Um, I think the Dane changes everything for him because, you know, once you win a big monument like this and, and you've been second in Flanders and you've been second in the worlds, there's teams going to bid on him as a potential leader. You know, the rumors I've heard, and, and the question is, you know, does he want that? And, and the other question is, will it make, really make so much, su such a big difference? He's end of contract in Ineos. We all know that Ineos has, you know, basically also unlimited, unlimited uh, budget possibilities if they want. Um, I, I personally think that will, he, that will be his first choice. But I knew before uh, today that Jumbo Visma was really, really after him to strengthen the team in the classics and in the, and in the Grand Tours. Uh, and now this morning, I've also heard that UAE is bidding very, very heavily on, on Dylan Bombarda. So obviously an amazing situation for him to be in. Um, but I don't exclude that he stays at Ineos. Um, no. You know, now that he, 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 he in, the, in, in 10 years, this is their first victory in Paris-Roubaix. They've been chasing it for a while. Um, and then you could say, okay, you know, maybe he wants to go to Jumbo Visma because he's Dutch and, you know, he goes to a Dutch team, you know, obviously he's going to go to a big team. And imagine, imagine um, Dylan on the same team as Wout Van Aert in a race like today. I mean, this changes the whole dynamics of the race. So he may not want to have any part of that because um, he might not have that chance again. And, and Wout Van Aert may not want any part of that either. Exactly. <clears throat> Well, you know, I've got to think that comes into play when you have a contract ending, ending, you get this extra motivation for a win. Well, right? yeah, hundred percent. Right? Yeah. You get that win. And then depending on your age, you might say, I have one more contract in me, maybe two or whatever that that's got to be a factor. Yes. I, I don't yeah. think for, I mean, Dylan's 30 years old. I mean, the guys, you know, he's still got a, several years left to go. I think he's been progressing in his career. Um, everybody, every cyclist, dreams of winning a race like Flanders, Roubaix. Um, I think the contract is just going to be a bonus thing for him, but I think that was the last thing on his mind today. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I per personally, if I, if I, you know, can imagine being in, in his position, you know, amongst those big teams, I don't think the contract offers are going to be uh, that, that, that different unless, you know, unless a team like UAE really goes crazy and, you know, they want him no matter what, and they're willing to pay whatever, uh, but in the other case, I would I would stay at the Ineos if I'm him. It's a great team. He's been he's there. That everybody he's gonna get paid a lot more, and and he can stay there until the end of his career. Um, otherwise, I mean we've seen guys. I mean let's let, look for example a guy like Niki Terpstra. He he he, exactly. he won Flanders. He won he won Roubaix. Went for an amazing contract to another team. Disappeared. We have not seen him anymore in the top ten of a race. Although this today he was for for a moment there by himself, but it was still 130 kilometers to go. So that's also something to consider if you feel if you really feel good at a team like Ineos, and I, I, you know, it's it's hard to argue that he doesn't feel good there. He, otherwise, he wouldn't have the results and the performances he's he's having. 
um, I would I would try to stay even if it's for a little bit less money. You know, of course, right. if the difference is too too big, then it's different. But you know, it's not going to be that much of a difference in my opinion. Mm. So Johan, speaking of Terpstra, didn't we? He was the last Dutch winner um, of Pre Roubaix, and I think we've come up with that he was also the last solo winner. And then mm-hmm. I think that's what we discussed earlier in the pre-show. Um, and then Johan, I thought you had a wonderful uh, title for Dylan that you know and yeah. how he races. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. As we close I, that I, up, because we should celebrate this. This is amazing. I, Two solo wins. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, obviously Van Bartle today, he, he, he rode like a real leader and, and at the end he was the strongest. But if you look at his performances from the past, and especially in the Tour of Flanders, he's a, he's a guy who knows all those races. And I wrote, the, I wrote down here during the, during the TV uh, broadcast, that he's the master of anticipation. Ooh, he, yeah, he we really are knows. dropping some serious yeah. nuggets today. <laughs> We're getting smarter he, on this podcast. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, you know, Johan, really and, and, go ahead Johan. and as you know i mean that comes with the with the territory someone like dylan is coming to the final of the race and a guy like wild ben art's going and matthew vanderpool is going and you're on the limit on the wheel and you're going shit i don't know if i can do that if i can hang with that next acceleration i got nothing to lose i'm gonna go before they go and see if i mm-hmm. get a gap and that's exactly what he did and uh not only that but he kept going stronger and stronger throughout the end yeah, but also I read in Flanders uh, after his second place that on four occasions, the four last years, he, 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 went, he went ahead of the main favorites exactly at the same place. In between, I think it's in between the Koppenberg and, uh, no, it's, it's in between the Patersburg and the Koppenberg, yeah. where, he, where, he, where he went ahead on the, you know, on the second, second time they passed. And, you know, that's obviously, you know, the, the, a, a guy I remember from the past who was a master in that also was uh, Rolf Sørensen. Rolf Sørensen, oh, he won the Tour of Flanders like that. So it takes yeah. a smart, it's, you need to be strong, but you need to be super smart. And today he was, he was smart and, and at the end he was the strongest. So, you know, deserve we, we should have for- We should have thrown it last week. I, I forget how, it, what context it came up. We were talking about these guys that are... <clears throat> They're just, they're mm. smarter than they are strong. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and I brought up Pascal Richard, but Rolf Sorensen was maybe exactly, the poster yeah. child. I mean, yeah. he was very, very strong, but he won a lot more bike races because of his brains than his legs. Mm-hmm. I would also, but yeah, there are dudes like that that are just sneaky. They know where to be from, at the right time. Bro, and from, an old, from an older generation, but, but you know, known for his name in, in nowadays, it was Adri van der Poel. Same, mm. same, same kind of rider. You know, was strong, but he was smarter than he was strong, and he won Flanders, and he won Roubaix, and no, he didn't. No, Liège Baston Liège, and didn't never won Roubaix. But uh, but yeah, there's there's riders like that. But Von Barla is definitely a guy like that, and I think you know deserved win for him, and but especially you know after the initiative of his team so early in the race, um, I think it's you know well de- well deserved winner. You know who else was was uh, smarter than they were strong and had and had I think more success on the bike or better results because of their brains than their legs. You know who? Okay, Johan Brunel. Give, Johan give it Brunel. to me. <laughs> Johan Brunel. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I agree. And, 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 I agree. and yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Ah, huh, good. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Any any other uh, last minute things from the crew? I think we do. We, we haven't really mentioned at all Mahorich. I mean, he was mm, in a breakaway guys. for 130 kilometers, y'all, and still finished in the first group. What, what an incredible ride. No fear, full gas. I mean, put it all out there today. I give him like the, the VIP uh, ride of the, of the day. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. 32 millimeter uh, tires and a 38 millimeter cockpit. That's pretty narrow for that guy. Um, no mm-hmm. dropper post today. He said there wasn't enough descents, but I like the way yeah. the guy rides. <laughs> yeah, Fearless. he's a badass. There were zero descents today. Yeah. <laughs> True statement. Yeah. All I learned is I have to be smarter and not stronger. Thank you for the life lessons today, gentlemen. <laughs> I have a quick question. Uh, well, one, send your questions and comments to the move at we do.team. Uh, but also you mentioned this Mallorca trip. Is that open to we do listeners to uh, sign up and join? First come, first serve. Yeah, so we'll, we'll 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 put it up on. Uh, I think we're gonna drop it on the socials on Tuesday. Tuesday. Okay, yeah. so if people there'll are be, interested, keep an eye yeah. on our socials. Yeah, there'll be a link in the like bio. Okay. Yeah. All right. 
well i think that that wraps it up we'll be back uh gosh soon next, next week. week yeah next, next week. week with Liège Boston Liège and well, i think the big my big headline there is i mean it's, i don't know if Ala Philippe coming back but quick step man little favor yeah I don't want yeah, to be at the dinner table with Patrick Lefebvre right now. Ah, uh, he's fine. He's fine. He's, you know, bullshit. He's, he's not he's, happy. He's if, not... You know what? If, if he's fine, then that's the problem. No, 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 no. He's, he's be running around happy. throwing stuff. He's not happy, but you know, you can, I mean, this, they've, they've been, they've been on top for the last 10 years. You know I mean? Today, I think today was kind of symbol, symbolic that Lampard crashed out. You know, to really confirm their bad spring season, you know, he was in a position to be on the podium, whether he would have gotten it or not, but he was in a position for the first time, they were in a position to be on the podium on a, of, a, of a spring classic and they crash out. So uh, uh, one, the one, new, one novelty uh, for Lies Baston Liege next week is that Walt Van Aert has changed his program and is starting Lies Baston Liege. So, oh, wow. Okay. Well, the worse it goes for them, the better the chances that Mark Cavendish starts the Tour de France. I think <laughs> seriously. So they have a, yeah, a big story. They have a, yeah, a big story to get behind for the season, right? Yep. For their sponsors. Where's, where's Cav nowadays, George? Where is he? Or he still, has he um, responded already? Has he responded <laughs> already to your July text? I honestly don't know where he's racing right now, but uh, yeah, he's responded. <laughs> okay. He does. He does race the Giro d'Italia though. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in everybody. Exciting weekend of racing, and uh, we'll be back next weekend. Okay, ciao. Happy, happy Easter. Ciao. Happy, happy Easter, Easter. Mark. <laughs>